Hello and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. I'm Emily Bell Marshall, I specialise in Caribbean folklore and post-colonial literature and I'm a reader in post-colonial literature at the School of Cultural Studies at Leeds Beckett University. My colleague historian Dr Rachel Rich will be feeding, fielding questions at the end of this. Details will be submitted in the chat. Um, so look out for that and please submit questions for Gary for the end of the interview. I'm absolutely delighted to have Gary here today. I'm a huge fan of Gary's. Gary will be discussing the Black Lives Matter movement um, and his book and his career as a journalist. Gary is a former co columnist for The Guardian and he's an editorial board member of The Nation magazine and the Alfred Nobler Fellow from Type Media. He's written five books, Another Day in the Death of America, a Chronicle of Ten Short Lives, The Speech, the story behind Martin Luther King's dream, Who Are We and Should It Matter in the 21st Century, Stranger in a Strange Land, Travels in the Disunited States, and No Place Like Home, a Black Britain's journey through the Deep South. He's also written for the New York Review of Books, Granter, GQ, The Financial Times and The New Statesman and made several radio and television documentaries on subjects ranging from gay marriage to Brexit. We're absolutely thrilled to be able to host this interview with Gary for the Centre for Culture and the Arts at Leeds Beckett. This event is also supported by the charities the David Ulawali Memorial Association and the Geraldine Connor Foundation. It's a live stream, streamed event, but it will also be recorded and made available on YouTube afterwards. Welcome, Gary. Thanks for having me, Emily. It's an absolute pleasure, Gary. OK, so the Black Lives Matter movement has sparked a range of global protests. <clears throat> so we've seen protests from um, the Black uh, Pete folk figure in Holland um, against uh, King Leopold's legacy in Belgium, and we've seen a toppling of statues in the UK. Can you tell us a little bit more about the different types of protests that took place over the summer and also what you think unites them? Uh, yeah, I think that um, what happened was was really quite interesting over the summer because what we're used to, particularly if we think of the civil rights era or even uh, Trayvon Martin or the previous iteration of Black Lives Matter was a, an act of solidarity and uh, and that's not exactly what happened this time. Of course, there was a solidarity with George Floyd and so on, but there was also a kind of pollination where the issues that were raised in America were kind of um, dispersed across the globe and then landed and found their own uh, found their own target, if you like. And so. <clears throat> As you say, Frater to Pete, or I mean, it's not that surprising in Britain and Belgium, maybe Holland as well, that things would be towards history and the kind of um, the kind of amputation, really, of our colonial legacy from the kind of collective national memory. Whereas in France, there was a lot of work done on Adama Traore, which is a more sort of direct translation of police um uh police brutality and uh uh injustice and i think what what they all have in common clearly we the nature of racism is different in all of these places and one of the things that would kind of bother me really was the extent to which and i was asked this just the other day in italy you know so where's better and i'd say that there is no <clears throat> there's no better kind of racism uh, America is a more lethal country in all sorts of ways in terms of it has more guns, it executes people, it locks people up more. You you know, nine kids at the moment are shot dead every day in America. Nowhere else can rival that in the Western world. But what it what they all had in common was an understanding that 
discrimination was prevalent and systemic and that in different ways too much ground had been given to the hard right and not just electorally but broadly speaking that there was we we were seeing the prospect of whatever rights we had gained and won being rolled back and i think you know because trump is not unique actually most countries have a trump whether it's ukip and farage or berlusconi who was the first trump really or get wilders and in all of these places there had been this kind of real backsliding and real um including britain this degradation of our uh, racial cultural historical conversation and of the rights and um uh, material kind of um uh, situation of black people particularly under covid and this was a kind of basta you know no more uh, that could translate everywhere in the same way that um, uh, the Occupy movement, while capitalism is different in lots of places, still could find a home in al almost everywhere. Yeah, I, I like the way you use the idea either that of pollination of these of the of the Black Lives Matter protests in America, pollinating protests around the world. I just want to turn towards the UK. Um, now, you've argued that the UK has exported a particular brand of racism, so to South Africa, to Rhodesia, to America, but that the white British mainstream culture has not been educated about its historical role in the new world because it happened abroad. Mm. Now, I'm wondering, do you think, you know, there, is there a danger that people still think that the problem is over there and not over here in the UK, especially in relation to racism? I think that's always going to be a problem uh, if we think of, um, you know, we were much better at, in the 80s at um, opposing apartheid than we were at opposing the sus laws, you know, or um, uh, uh, what what have you in the Thatcherite agenda. I think that um, so I think that's always going to be a problem and it's why it's why so much of the conversation veers around history and symbols of history because um, to kind of take Sivan Andan's words about we, we are here because you were there but if you didn't know you were there then of course you don't understand why I'm here and you know and i think in a range of ways we see this play out i think we saw it play out during the brexit referendum where regardless of the, i do believe that there are sound reasons why people might want to leave the european union i i voted to remain but i also sincerely believe that that campaign was run in part on a kind of uh, post-colonial, post-imperial nostalgia, put the great back into Great Britain, well, where did the great come from? And so actually in direct contradiction to the claims of uh, Boris Johnson, who Paul Gilroy calls Mr. Toad, who I think is quite, is kind of, is quite funny, but um, uh, he says, you know, we can't deny our history. We can't, when you take down these statues, you're, you, you can't excise a part of history. And it's like, actually, we want the opposite. Too much of our history has been excised. And so nothing makes sense. You walk around, there are these big buildings, Rhodesia House, I'm, or f just opposite my house in Hackney, there's a place called Freetown Villas. Well, these things come from somewhere. And... Um, uh, it's actually very, very difficult to make sense of the world that we live in if you have no sense of the past. And so in complete um, contradiction to Boris Johnson saying you can't excise past our history, we want to fill it in. The good and the bad, the, you know, the, the terrible examples of racism, the slave owners, the slaveholders, but also the anti-racists, the people in Manchester who boycotted Southern Cotton, the anti-Nazi League. I mean, Britain has a proud history of anti-racism that 
goes quite alongside its shameful history of racism. And they all involve white people as well as black people, not in the racist side, but in the other side. So it would be great to actually, that to me would involve putting the great back into Great Britain, but also realizing that sometimes Britain has not been so great. And um, um, it's not gonna help us if we don't understand, if we don't understand that, not least because everybody else knows, <laughs> I mean, the people in Barbados and Zimbabwe and South Africa, they all know in in uh, in America, they on July the fourth. Um, oh, this must be a tough day for you, you know, when Britain lost America. And I would say, first of all, my people really didn't have a dog in that fight, particularly. But secondly, pretty much any day of the year, someone is celebrating getting rid of the Britons. It's just the British people don't know anything about it. So July fourth is just another day for us. Yeah. So. Um... You talk about that nostalgia for colonialism in Britain, you know, and absolutely, I, I think that's very much a, alive and kicking. Uh, I took part in a review of statues in Leeds after the toppling of the statue of El Edward Colson to look at if we, if we had any objectionable statues, you know, and, and if you look at the statues we have, they're generally of, you know, they uh, they're celebrate empire, they celebrate, celebrate royalty, um, they celebrate great white men. But, um, you know, there is this outrage at the moment, isn't there, in Britain as well, about history being rewritten and, and these historical icons like Kirch, Churchill being invalidated. So mm -hmm. how do we, you said we need to fill it in the narrative. In your view, what is the best way to do that? Is that through education? You know, how, what, what, are, what do you think are, you know, the, the tools that we can use to create that change? Well, I think education is a is a clear one, um, and and we we must be aware history is always in the process of being rewritten. Of course, it is. Um, uh, I mean, it's not you know it's never done. Is it, um, um, I can't remember who said the past is the past is never past. It's not even past. Um, uh, so, of course, of course, history is being rewritten suggests something Aurelian, but it's constantly being revised and uh, we are constantly finding out new things and that helps us reinterpret where we are. And history is also generally written by the victors and it also reflects its moment in time. It's as much about the time in which the history is written as it is about the historical moment itself. So um, the education system would seem like a obvious place uh, to start, but you know, I don't see any reason why we can't just up our game in terms of public conversation. There's no need to be stupid about this. Actually, it's perfectly possible for Winston Churchill to be a war hero and a uh, violator of human rights. Actually, those things usually go hand in hand for most war heroes. Stalin was a war hero and a violator of human rights. So was de Gaulle. I mean, it's not a kind of, a, it didn't take that amount of imagination to keep both of those ideas in your head at the same time. And um, uh, and so I think uh, because this is a, a university uh, conversation, I'd say it's kind of also up to us to to up the standard. Uh, first of all, by introducing new stories and finding out new things and um, and putting them in the mix that kind of the history that we have obviously doesn't include an awful lot of people who were there, the women, the black people, the gay people, the, the kind of the poor quite often aren't and yet they too have stories and as we excavate those stories we can introduce them into the kind of body of knowledge and fill it out so um uh, so there's there's that work but then there's just the the work of of trying to have robust and um uh robust conversations that have some intellectual merit that um uh throwing your toys out of the trap pram because somebody has pointed out something that is true about churchill is 
is not is is really not not going to help us. And um, all too often, I see these conversations actually before they get to be conversations descend into a pretty trite culture war piece of nonsense where things that nobody is demanding politically are suddenly held dear rule britannia being a good example and and made sacred and um uh, we can do better than that so um so robust conversation robust dialogue um education using education as a platform to what we might say decolonize the curriculum those are the ways you could see our country moving forward in terms of uh, tackling racism and tackling colonial legacies well, what i wanted to ask you gary also is you've lived in the us um and the uk and some a, a lot of your work you know is comparative um how would you compare black communities in the uk and the US in terms of their cultural and political capital. Do you think that the UK suffers from not having a, a powerful black middle class or long-standing black institutions like we see in the US? And do you think that that also prevents us from tackling racism and uh, legacies of racism in this country? Um, well, I think it's certainly true that we don't have a substantial middle class. Um, it's certainly true as well that we don't have long-standing institutions um, and um, but it's also true that we are in some ways not having a long-standing middle class actually kind of um, isn't such a kind of isn't necessarily such a terrible thing we don't have massive class fissures having centuries old institutions which does build capacity in anti-racist movements most definitely but also uh kind of generally can make things kind of quite conservative and quite kind of um you know we've never done it like this quite institutionalized uh what we do have here i think is uh a sharper class analysis than they would have in america and because in significant numbers our communities are fairly recent on this soil in significant numbers and because we are from a less powerful uh, uh, country we also have a much more internationalist perspective than um, black america would generally and so I would say that we are, you know, we are equipped in different ways and we are also kind of dealing with quite different beasts, you know, that um, segregation is very new. Uh, uh, desegregation is very new. Segregation is very recent. And uh, I've been intrigued with the conversations about Trump and democracy. People say, you know, our democracy is about centuries old democracy is about to be violated and it's like well it's, it's not centuries old actually it's about 60 years old that's when black people could vote um uh that was the last significant kind of broadening of the franchise and um uh and so you know for the so the issues of and issues of race are kind of built into the kind of democratic um uh the, the kind of gaps in democratic capacity so gerrymandering uh disenfranchisement of felons uh, there's a range of ways in which kind of um uh, black people struggle there here we have kind of quite sometimes analogous but uh, in other times quite different challenges the windrush scandal was a very particular I would say European, I could imagine something like that happening in France or Germany with Turks in a different way or Belgium, but that kind of, I couldn't imagine it happening in America, actually. I just, um, not that particular thing, uh, because it is the kind of fusion of race and place of immigration, 
and ethnicity, which is not decoupled in America, but isn't isn't kind of hinged in quite the same way. So I think we are differently equipped for di very different kinds of um, uh, different kinds of struggles. And I think that we we're very different communities and we have very different kind of consciousness. So um, thinking again, then uh, continuing to think about, you know, those the sort of differences and, and connections between um, Europe and America. What do you think that the impact of the pandemic has had on the Black Lives Matter movement and its future and that sense of uh, solidarity? Um, that you talked about uh, in terms of supporting anti-racist movements. Um, I like to think that we saw a growth in allyship. Um, you know, being an ally has become part of common parlance now. Um, and perhaps that was to do with people um, globally feeling a deeper sense of empathy with one another through this, this stark reminder of their shared vulnerability in the face of COVID-19. Um, and perhaps that will be long lasting, but but I think perhaps I'm a bit of a of an optimist. Um, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, I'd like to think that I'm not sure that I do. <laughs> I'm not sure that I share your optimism, although when it comes to being pessimistic, I'm always glad to be proved wrong. Um, uh, the truth is, I think there's a contextual connection between COVID and what it has done and the Black Lives Matter movement, which was um, that on the one hand, in one moment, you saw the video of George Floyd and you saw the videos of, you know, Blake and uh, of others and you, you, there was this stark, dramatic, uh, often with a kind of clear sort of moral morality play the white cop the black man it was uh, or Breonna Taylor there was I mean that was in court and video but there was this um, um, there was this morality play and this clarity and it, it was death and there were things you could share on social media and then there was Covid which was which killed a lot more people than the US cops were ever going to be a lot more will ever do a lot more black people and which was the slow drumbeat of racism I because when I what I always fear when something like Trayvon Martin or or um, George Floyd happens is that, is that there's a certain group of people who think oh that's racism and it's like well it is but actually Racism is a lot more complex than that as well. That is the most brazen form, the most clear form, but that quite often it's the for, form filling and the, you know, the, um, um, the kind of th that slow drumbeat of us being at the bottom of every pile, whether it's housing or employment or education and what happened with COVID is you saw all that come together so who was most likely to be an essential worker who couldn't stay at home who didn't have a garden who um uh who was less emboldened and empowered to challenge their rota um uh who are the key workers all of that kind of came through who lives in cramped conditions um all of that came through in the death toll but each one of those things it's not like somebody was standing there and saying right you must all live in cramped conditions that's not the way it works it works systemically and so with the with, with the one you saw um there was evidence of this slow steady systemic institutional crushing of community that was literally killing us um but that you don't share on social media and you don't say wow did you see that and it doesn't always you know come up on um telly and it, i'm i'm minded uh, there's this phrase that i use you know when i study journalism they'd say um when a dog bites a man they always did use the masculine it's not a story when a man bites a dog it's a story 
And after a while, you get to thinking, but who owns these dogs? And why do the same people keep getting bitten? And sometimes the things that we've become used to, oh, well, that's where black people live, or that's where they die, or that's the kind of houses they live in, or that's the kind of jobs that they do. We stop to ask, well, why? What you know? Why? Why are we? Why, why is? Why are we so inured to this that we that it's just become normal and it's not news? So, you know, black people are, are four times more likely to black people are four times more likely to die from COVID. And as you say, this is also linked closely to jobs, to housing, to education. So, in, in many ways, COVID highlights those racial inequalities. Mm. Um, I want to turn, uh, Gary, to your incredible and heartbreaking book, Another Day in the Death of America. Um, regarding the number of young people killed by gunfire every day in the US, you write, the truth is happening every day. Only most, only, only most do not see it. 23rd of November 2013 was one of those days. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the book and also your position on American gun laws. Well, the book is um, built on a basic premise that uh, every day at the time, seven children or teens were shot dead in America. It's gone up to nine now, um, but at the time it was seven on average. And I picked a day at random, November the 23rd, 2013, and then spent a year and a half, two years, finding out who they were, each kid, putting, um, you know, a child's face on the statistic. And I went through their Twitter feeds, their Facebook pages, their Instagram accounts, I, wh where I could, I met their families, teachers, preachers, coaches, and so on. And, um, and it was, it was what I'd call a show, not a tell book. So, I didn't actually do a lot of discussion of gun laws in the book. I think I say this isn't a book about gun control. It's just a book that is possible in a country without gun control. <laughs> Not least because, well, there are two reasons why I wouldn't have um, um, expanded on my position on guns in the book. The first is that um Americans would not take lightly to a Brit talking about you know something that's in their constitution so I wouldn't get a hearing but secondly because it would be a really short book get rid of guns that's my position on gun control is that um American kids aren't worse than kids anywhere else in the world their parents aren't worse than anywhere else in the world but um guns are extremely deadly you put them in a country with the history of segregation, racism, massive inequality, no um, state health care, which means no care for the mentally ill, uh, with massive exclusions disproportionately for African-American uh, and Latino kids. And onto that big pile of tinder, you put a lethal weapon. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Absolutely. Um, and Gary, it was, it was not long after writing this book that you moved to the UK um, and you write in the book um, that you became invested in American politics, uh, especially after the birth of your children. You say, now it was personal. I had skin in the game, black skin in the game, where the odds are stacked against it. I was wondering if the writing of the book and the research that you conducted for it had an effect on your decision to leave the US? Uh, it didn't really. I decided to leave uh, two years earlier. Um, uh, one gift that Britain gave me growing up in the 70s was that the racism was such with people saying, you're not from here, go back to where you come from, bet it's cold where you come from, uh, bet it's colder than this, you know, but I bet it's cold compared to where you come from, all of that stuff. And a mum from Barbados who would say, you know, outside you can be English, inside you're Barbadian and all of that, meant that I grew up with a very ambivalent relationship to place. And so when I, I was in America for 12 years and people would say, do you miss Britain? And I'd say, no, not really. 
you know, I always liked it when I came back, but I didn't miss it. And um, um, my wife is American. My kids were born there. We had planned to stay there. And then it just kind of seemed, it kind of just generally, this is 2011, made more sense to kind of um, come back. And if I was looking to escape racism, I wouldn't have come back to Britain. Do you know what I mean? That would have been a really weird choice. So, um, uh, no, no, it didn't. I mean, doing the book, it did, I was um, glad, I was glad that I had made that decision. I did think, oh, well, this is something I'm not going to have to deal with, you know, but I didn't think, I, I wouldn't have left on, on, on the basis of that alone. Yes, so clearly moving to Britain is not a move that is going to help you escape racism, as you say. Um, and you've already mentioned uh, the Windrush scandal as a, you know, a quite what you see as a very typically uh, British scandal. Um, so t 2020 was the third anniversary of Grenfell and the Windrush scandal. And I was wondering, in your view, you know, what these devastating events tell us about how racism manifests itself in the UK specifically? Well, they can't, I mean, both of them really speak to um, the institutional, the, the, that drumbeat that I'm talking about, both of them in their different ways. I mean, what's interesting about Grenfell is that it, it takes on a dramatic, uh, position in the kind of um, uh, in the political conversation once there's a fire but in a run-up to the fire it's a bunch of gnarly residents complaining about health and safety and uh, I think a local council or a private contractor I can't remember kind of putting up some cladding so it didn't look too ugly for the people who lived around it and so you have I think I described it as a four horsemen of uh, uh, of the apocalypse of kind of late stage capitalism, of which I'm probably going to forget at least one. But privatisation, deregu uh, deregulation, uh, inequality. I can't remember the other one. But that kind of it was. Um, they could have and probably did live in a state or in a precarious um uh in a precarious state in that uh tower for many years and could have lived there for many more years had there not been that fire and that is a very good example of institutional racism actually the degree to which you look at that building and you can't see the awfulness that was taking place until there was a fire and similarly with Windrush, which was a kind of question of, you know, on the most basic level of paperwork, you know, four pieces of information for every year you were here and all across the country, people losing their jobs, houses, healthcare. And the Guardian ran stories about that for about nine months and nothing happened. Nothing happened. People, people in deportation cells and waiting to be and people who were deported but the voices of people in deportation cells who worked in the house of commons and had lived there kind of you know for 50 years and all the rest of it and um uh i talked spoke to a media gentleman who broke the stories and she was saying that in almost every case what would happen is just to just that the Home Office would regularise the people's situation just as they were going to press. Actually, one time in between them going to press and uh, calling the Home Office, they changed and said, OK, yeah, well, we, yeah, they, they, they have the right to remain. So they knew. They knew all along. And this speaks to the absolute kind of uh, crucial nature of political activism because they only act when they have to there was no pressure on them to act and so 
No one was calling them, maybe an MP, maybe, and the Guardian. But they didn't feel no pressure, so they didn't do anything. It's that great quote from the um, uh, American abolitionist Frederick Douglass, that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And a, a significant section of that Windrush generation would still be in deportation cells or would have been deported with absolutely no recompense and no apology and any of that had there not been political pressure. And and you, you've you argued, uh, Gary, you know, quite rightly that the Grenfell tragedy and the Windrush scandal are stories you know, which are as much about class as they also are about race. And Britain has a deeply embedded class system. and. I was wondering what you think of the, the importance of highlighting that intersectionality when we discuss these matters of race and class you know, or gender. Well, I think it's very important because people get tripped up on it in a very weird way. There are people who, um, particularly on the left, who want to insist that race is just kind of how you feel and what you eat and what you dance to. And that class is the only thing that matters, and that um, and that somehow these are these two separate beasts um, who uh, maybe occasionally meet but have nothing to do with each other. And my feeling is that to understand race or class separately is to misunderstand them both completely. That they are intertwined. Um, intersectionally as is you know with a, a bunch of other rogue characters you know gender and sexuality and region and nationality these are all religion they all come into it and that um, um, it's a perverse notion that we can talk about one it, well it's another good example of like you can keep two ideas in your head at the same time nobody asked for George Floyd's bank account before they killed him. Like race is, 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 does what it says on the packet, discriminates on the grounds of race. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a class element to racial attacks and that um, if George Floyd were richer, he probably, for a range of reasons, wouldn't have been in that situation. So um, uh, yeah, I think it's absolutely fundamental to understand them as being engaged. And for the orthodox Marxists out there, Marx understood that. Um, so I'm not sure why kind of 160, 170 years later, 160 odd years later, people would find it so difficult. I found it really interesting when you pointed out in your book um, how Marx understood that, um, you know, which I, I which has been overlooked, as you say. Um, I want to ask you quite a big question um, as we finish off um, the interview. Well, I want to ask you two two big questions, really. But um, I wanted to know, you know how this your long career in journalism, the hundreds of interviews that you've conduct, conducted, your, your frontline research, how how that has affected your worldview, your your views of human nature. Um, I guess. Um, what it's done, being forced to talk to Trump supporters, to I, I have to talk to a lot of people that I don't agree with, uh, which is good for me, frankly, not necessarily good for everybody. Um, and it, it forced an understanding that everybody has a rationale they're not just mad. So then you have to work out what, so what, how do you see the world? What are you, you know, what, what do you want? How are you thinking? And that kind of, um, while it can be comfortable to reduce people to caricatures at times, and I'm not saying that I've never done it, um, ultimately it's really unsatisfying and you end up not really learning anything. And so it's kind of really, um, I'm not sure that it taught me in so far as I'm not sure that I didn't know already, but it has forced on me an understanding of a kind of, um, uh, that it is actually possible to have a conversation with these people. Um, 
you, you and your challenge is to kind of let go of a lot of your baggage and and uh, not not agree with them, not meet them in the middle, but actually find out what. So where are you coming from? What do you want? Do you know? I remember speaking to this guy in America, and I said, you know, so why are you going to vote Trump? And he said, uh, well, he's going to make America great again. And I said, do you think he will though? And he said, no, I don't. He said, uh, so, you know. And he said, well, I think he's going to try. And I voted for Obama two times, and. I don't think he got there, you know, and it was like, oh, okay, I mean, weird, but like, not crazy, not, it's um, uh, an honest and complicated. Yeah, I think, look, I think we could all do with having discussions with people that we disagree with. And, you know, as you point out in your work, a lot of people who voted for Trump, you know, also voted for Obama. So we tend to see these things as such, so binary. Um, and we don't engage with di in dialogue with people that we disagree with. Um, now, uh, I just want to ask you, Gary, as, as my last question to you, um, you know, we've seen the momentum the Black Lives Matter movement has gathered, um, particularly over the summer. Do you feel hopeful of change um, or will much of the changes that institutions and governments globally have committed themselves to in the wake of and the movement, do you think that it'll be purely tokenistic and lack longevity? I think that is um, in play right now. And that um, uh, I think that that pollination I referred to, this is anecdotal, but the anecdotes keep coming to me that in different ways I've seen uh, some people have their consciousness raised and other people be emboldened and um, and then therefore kind of seek the space within their institution, their community, their work to kind of change something or do something. And that it's kind of like a thousand shafts of light as opposed to one big conflagration. But wherever I turn, I hear this thing. I he I hear of different ways in which uh, people are pushing and shoving and um, uh, lobbying and arguing and 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 finding that the door is, if not open, is not quite as firmly shut as they thought it was. And it's a difficult thing to track. Um, but uh, I am I am hopeful, but I, I, I and I think it's going to be um, that those changes are going to be kind of um, relatively small, but also relatively impactful because they will be local. They will be where you know where people live. I have given the nature of what this government's done and the people it's appointed and so on, I have absolutely no faith that they will do anything. I think they will not even pay um, uh, lip service, but thankfully there's more to politics and government and um, elections. And um, so, yes, in a range of ways, I think that um, uh, that there are grounds to hope that the momentum will carry on, but it won't carry on in the same way. It won't be large numbers of people in the street. It won't be hashtag anymore, but it will be your governor's meeting, your kind of uh, your union meeting or, um, you know, or your staff meeting or something. I think that's where that's where I feel it's happening now. Thank, thanks, Gary, you know, for those superb insights and I know that the our audience will just be itching to ask you a few questions so I'm going to hand over to my colleague Dr Rachel Rich um, who's a historian at the School of Cultural Studies and she's been fielding some questions fr from our audience for you Gary. Hi Gary. Hi there. Uh, th thank you so much it's such a lot to think about and the audience have been thinking and I'm going to try and read the questions in the order that they've been coming in. So I'll start with this one. Jenny says that an article in The Observer from June by Keenan Malik said, 
White privilege is a distraction, leaving racism and power untouched. And she'd like to know what your views are on that idea. Um, I don't know that I fully agree with that. I think that there is there is a problem with all of these words and terms, which is that you have to be careful how you use them and where you use them. And that kind of, I see white supremacy thrown around quite often where I think, mm, I think that's just racism. I think that's just kind of <laughs> just straight up racism and that kind of uh, white supremacy has its own history and so on. Um, uh, I do understand why some people would have a problem with the term white privilege and will would bristle, particularly working class people, at the notion that they have any privileges. But for the most part, I think, people who don't want to fight racism will find a way not to fight it. And uh, that may be because people are using the wrong words or it may be because, um, you know, they they don't like them taking a knee or raising a fist or not standing for the national anthem or so. Uh, I don't want to over privilege or overemphasize one term or one word as being kind of the, the linchpin. I think if your mind is open, then you can deal with the word you don't like and you can even push back on it and still get to the place you need to be. Yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I love that. Um, the next question is uh, more about you. Um, so people want to know who were your literary influences growing up and how they've shaped your career and your writing? It's an interesting one. Um, so um, <coughs> it was it was mostly women to start, actually. Um, uh, Alice Walker, my Angie, almost all African American women. Um, and then um, uh, Ryszard Kapuscinski, the Polish uh, journalist uh, and writer. Um, and then as I got um, old E.H. Carr, um, the historian, Stuart Hall, um, uh, so a range, um, a uh, yeah, but I would say, um, I mean, it shifted a bit from fiction to non fiction, um, uh, as I got older and became a lot less. Um, a lot less American. June Jordan was one. Her essays I found very um, uh, impactful. And as time went on, it kind of it was very political. And then it became um, a bit more sort of philosophical and not particularly academic, but uh, slightly more philosophical. Nice, nice. Well, hopefully people have caught some of those names if they want to go and read some themselves. Um, yeah, OK. Um, someone's asked a question in relation to something you said a bit earlier about, like, uh, you know, all the different stories that don't get the attention they need. Um, so the question is, how do we get those other narratives of black people, women, poor people into the mainstream and media in particular and to become accepted as part of the dialogue about our past? Yeah, I, I think we have to fight for them. Um, and um, I think sometimes it's possible to overprivilege the media, frankly, as someone who's come out of the media that kind of, um, uh, you know, can be can be great to have something in the Observer or the Guardian. But actually, if you can convince a, a group of people, I don't know, in your community or um, in your kind of area to kind of take up, say, the kind of to engage with the story of, say, Claudette Colvin, whose story is one of my favourites because I found her in the Bronx and she was the young woman who was kicked off the bus before Rosa Parks in Montgomery, but she was too dark and she got pregnant and they just dropped her. And um, um, and 
and then you know I found her, and that was a great way to kind of use that story to um, uh, to talk about other things. I think when Alice Walker kind of resurrected Zora Neale Hurston, I don't think that happened in the mainstream. I think that happened in like Miz, mm. and then you know. If, so I think that there's a kind of sometimes people get hung up on getting on the six o'clock news when the people that you want to reach ain't watching the six o'clock news you know and um uh so i i, I feel what what's important is to get the stories to the people who who we feel it's important understand them and then the fighting for them is fighting for their candidacy into the canon but the canon don't just let women and black people in just say okay you know we were wrong uh, let's talk about Claudette Colvin now. They they do it because people say, well, we're not taking you seriously unless you talk about Claudette Colvin or George Duxon or, you know, what whoever the kind of, you know, the 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 range of characters who've been who've been left out. Like, you know, some state someone says, you have a history of American women rights and you haven't mentioned Zora Neale Hurston, then you're not serious and you're not doing your job right. And sooner or later, the the, you know, the door caves in, but it don't cave in because you knock, knock politely. It caves in when you kick it in. All right, well, I'm glad we're kicking in some doors. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, okay, here's a question that's sports related, so I don't understand it, but I'm hoping that you will. <laughs> um, Nigel Walker was reported in The Guardian as saying he doesn't believe institutional racism exists in sports, but rather it's a case of people turning a blind eye. And the que the person asking the question wonders what you think of this. Well, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, uh, I don't know an awful lot about sports either, but I think that that is the kind of statement that could be used for almost anywhere. And um, uh, the reason why I think it was important to understand what happened with COVID alongside what happened with George Floyd is because the housing departments and the employers and the schools aren't filled with evil people trying to do wrong to black people. They are working in a system that kind of mitigates against poor people and black people are overrepresented among the poor and which has a history of exclusion of not understanding black people in a certain way of kind of you know walking in you know and thinking that i'm must be the driver that i couldn't be you know on the show kind of thing and so um so if you understand racism as just being bad people doing evil things then of course that's not most people um but if you understand it as a series of processes and assumptions and presumptions that when challenged often don't have then then yeah it's not a blind eye actually it's a very selective eye on a very selective um uh, on a select group of people and that's what institutional racism is and i think it's why people find it so hard to understand because they they understand if you understand racism as bad names bad people and violence only then everything else just looks like either bad luck or laziness yeah, yeah. I'm going to try and read a longish question and just get it in there. So, OK, I'm just going to read it out. Okay. It's often said that there are six regions of Africa, North, South, East, West, Central and Diaspora. What are your thoughts on the idea of an age of return following on from Ghana's year of return, welcoming people from the African diaspora back home? Is it similar in any way to the Pan-Africanist mood in the 60s and 70s with people like Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, etc. traveling to Africa? Is the age of return a significant black movement? I don't think so, which doesn't mean that it couldn't be or that it might not be for some people. I mean, for me personally, I like to distinguish my and this speaks to the stuff I was talking about before, about being ambivalent about place, to make a distinction between my identity and my place where I am. 
and that I, um, having grown up in Britain and being told you're not really British, and then you go to Barbados and they say you're not really, you know, that thing which most first generation people have, realizing, okay, I'm not going to find a sense of community in a geographical space. I'm going to find it where my people are. And my people are people who like to drink and laugh and read and critique and they are kind of left wing, but they are not uh, particularly dogmatic. And um, and so my people are everywhere. And so I can be everywhere. And so the kind of, um, I mean, I've spent quite a lot of time in Africa. I reported from um, South Africa a lot for The Guardian. Uh, I lived for a year in Sudan and then just traveled around for um, uh, for various kind of work things. And, I, you know, I like some bits better than others, um, but I don't feel the need to be there or in Barbados, where my parents are from, or in America, or in Britain, frankly, in order to feel fulfilled intellectually or racially. So it's kind of not for me. But um, not everybody had my upbringing and other people feel differently. I think there's a key distinction between the 60s and now, which is that in the 60s, pretty much the whole black diaspora was having the same conversation, which was how do we get the vote? that African-Americans uh, and people in Africa were all uh, fighting for their civil rights in different ways. I think now we are in significantly different places because of the way that neoliberal globalization has kind of disempowered the newly independent African country. So I do think that it is different. That's an amazing answer. And I like the sound of your kind of people. I'd like to be one of those fun drinking people. Um, I'm going to uh, thank you so much for answering the questions. There were a few more that we unfortunately didn't get to, but you answered them so fully. Um, I'm sure people are really grateful. And I'm just going to hand back over to Emily now to thank you for this amazing interview. Thank you, Gary. Yes, I, I love the idea of the, the global community um, that, you know, you're you're at home wherever you're amongst your people who are the people like minded people. Um, a huge thanks, Gary, for joining us today You know, and for your, your generosity, um, your superb insights um, and for sharing your expertise. Uh, it's been a really inspiring interview for me and I hope our audience feel the same. Um, a huge thank you to Rachel Rich too for fielding questions and also to the Centre for Culture and the Arts um, to the David Olawali Memorial Association and the Geraldine Connor Foundation for supporting this event. Um, please check out the next two Black History Month events organised by Rachel and myself for the Centre for Culture and the Arts at Leeds Beckett. So we have uh, Professor Rob Burrows talking about the racialization of gratitude in the 19th century and beyond, and Dr. Jess Van Horsen talking about Tupac Shakur and the embodiment of black history. Gary, I wish that I could uh, take you for a drink after this event. Unfortunately, we are stuck online, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Goodbye. Bye.